with John 21. How many fish did they catch? 153. That's puzzled many people. And I thought, I'm going to learn from Barry tonight what that stands for. And I waited. And of course, you don't have time to share everything you know. So I thought, I wonder, it's such a challenge coming here. Can I teach you anything you don't know? Because you're a very wise bunch and I come here to learn from you, not to teach. But anyway, 153. About 20 years ago, I used to sit at Gold Hill next to Harry Henderson. Do you remember him? Harry Henderson, old Irishman, died about 10 years ago from a brethren background, Northern Ireland. Tony, he said, you must read these books, but I want them back. He lent me a book called Spiritual Arithmetic by Reginald Nash, published in 1926. Got that? Long before computers. And another book by a man called Filmer, a few years later, God Counts. And I've always heard about numbers in the Bible meaning something, but I can never remember what they mean. So I made myself a note, numerical values in the Holy Bible. And I thought, I think that 153 is in there somewhere. So I looked it up, and it is there, among all the other numbers. And I love it when one sermon follows another, because I always think that might be God leading us through a sequence of teaching. So, we know that Jesus was crucified, raised from the dead, and he reappeared, among other places, in John 21, which is right where he first called his first disciples on the shore of the lake. And he called out to them in John 21, 5, with the words, Friends, haven't you caught any fish? What does that connect with when Jesus was first there? Is it early in Luke when he called the apostles? Was it Matthew? It doesn't matter. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That was that first call. And what's Peter doing? He's gone back to catching fish. And they haven't caught any. Friends, haven't you any fish? It's quite an amusing side to it there, isn't it? Jesus again having to teach Peter how to catch fish. And how many did they catch? Catch 153 large fish. So what can we get out of this? Well, this book has in it, I slowly remembered, some very clever things. And there's encouragement here for us who are in the second half of life, or even extra time, or even injury time. Thinking of football, which I hope few of us watch, but it's the score at the end that matters as we hang in there, overcoming in hope to the end. Now, as you know, in Hebrew and Greek, every letter of the alphabet represents a number. How does it go? In Hebrew, you've got Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, Hai, one, two, three, four, five. And so these men in this, these books of theirs, they discovered that 153 numerically represents sons of God. I mean, in Hebrew, the New Testament there reads Ben Ha Elohim, Ben Ha Elohim, sons of Elohim, sons of God. Okay, so 153 fish in the net represent sons of God. And they are those who will be raised to eternal life. I like that, the net. The fish. Number eight was a number of the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And ichthus, the word for fishes, has a numerical value of 1224, which is 153 times eight. The full number of the sons of God times resurrection. It's like a code that says, The whole message, you know, is true. Sons of God, those in Christ, will be resurrected for eternal life. Then we noted the net was not broken. Every fish was brought home by the net. Reminding us how in John 10.10, Jesus said, no one could pluck his sheep out of his hand or his father's hand. It's a beautiful picture of the sons and the daughters, ladies of God, the saints of Christ, 
brought safely home and resurrected. None will be lost. So they were all held in the net and which did not break. And where does your mind go next? My mind went to the parable of the net. Matthew 13, verses 47 onwards. I thought that's rather a nice piece. It fits with what we've just seen. So often the Bible has it here, there and there, all with the same message. We have a great hope. Matthew 13, 47 onwards. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I like that picture, but it reminded me, fiery furnace, if you ask people who know the Bible, where does that occur? We all hear Book of Daniel, fiery furnace. And I thought, does it occur anywhere else? I checked on the computer. These are the only two references I can find to the fiery furnace. Interesting. So the fish represent the sons of God, the righteous ones, it says here, the good fish. This is a parable explaining what the kingdom of God is like. And that begs the question, how do I become a good fish, a righteous person? And I was really blessed by old Fred Beatty in our house fellowship. He died aged 91 about five or ten years ago. And he used to say, one of my memory verses, he'd been well discipled when he was in his late teens, and he'd learned certain good memory verses. And one of his memory verses came from Leviticus. Uh, and not many people can quote many verses from Leviticus, but he quoted, I am the Lord who makes you holy. I loved that because I never feel the least bit holy. The more I think about myself and Jesus, the more unholy I feel. It's not about feeling holy. But then I found that phrase in Leviticus five times. I underlined them in Leviticus 20 to 22. And that's such a relief and a release. We know the Holy Spirit makes us holy. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Word, which we share, but he baptizes in the Holy Spirit, not us. So we know that's how he will do it, but it isn't a feeling. But then you've got that line, I am the Lord who makes you holy. That's a really precious verse to me. Dear old Fred, if I judge myself, I am a failure with a sinful nature. If I compare myself to Jesus, I am definitely on the way to the fiery furnace. But if he died for me, there's hope. Jesus can save all of us who turn to him. And that promise from Leviticus is truly liberating. Why don't we all read Leviticus more? There's some lovely lines in there. Now back to the sons of God in Ben La Elohim. I love it when these sermons flow from one to the next. And I remember when I was last here, I thought, what do I share, Lord? And I shared a line or two from the last books I've read. One was about Bonhoeffer, end of life. He was saying that death is the gateway to paradise. It was not something to be feared. He was 20, you know, he was, I think he was 26 or 34 when he preached that. He was going to die soon after. He died without any fear. And he was an example to those who knew him. And uh, well, I also shared a line from Michael Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm. And The Unseen Realm dwells on the word Elohim. And I found it occurs in the Bible two and a half thousand times. And it's translated with various words. It's difficult to translate, but he said the best thing is the spiritual realm or the unseen realm, in his opinion. So then I looked up from the same source, well, how do they translate the famous confession of St. Thomas? You know, my Lord and my God. I think it's David Pawson taught that, that was probably the time of Domitian, in the eight years after AD 90. 
Domitian persecuted Christians and demanded he be known as Deus et Domine, God and Lord. And then St. Thomas says to Jesus, you are my Lord and my God, not the Roman Emperor. But in Hebrew, he probably said, Adonai, my Yahweh. Adonai, Lord, my Yahweh, my God, according to one of these Messianic Jews. And Michael Heiser's book was inspired by him reading Psalm 82 in Hebrew. Turn to Psalm 82. I looked briefly at this a year ago and I thought, I want to revisit that. I did it too quickly. And it's quite good fun to take it a bit slower. Psalm 82. In English, God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. And in verse 5, no, verse 6, it says, I said, you are gods. If you've got a King James, it's ye are gods. Ye are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. What's special about that verse? Who quotes it? It's Jesus. It's in John chapter 10, 31. The Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you are a mere man claim to be God. And then Jesus, so clever, selecting this verse from Psalm 82, he quotes it, and he answered them, Is it not written in your law, or your Torah, your teaching, and he includes the Psalms in his teaching, I have said you are gods. In English, it's a little g. We regard that as demonic spirits. That's not the meaning. It's the word Elohim again. If he called them Elohim, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I say I am God's son, or the sons of Elohim, the sons of the Most High. Elohim presides, he gives judgment among the Elohim. What does this mean? Does God judge himself? Michael Heisler wants to translate that as Yahweh of the unseen realm judges in the unseen realm. And when you get much further than that, you get into trouble because it gets so invisible and complicated and incomprehensible. But that's the trouble with the Holy Spirit and Elohim and the spiritual realm. We get taught that it is like this and like that. Yahweh is unseen, and he judges the rest of the unseen. But that word, I said, you are Elohim, you are all sons of the Most High. That's verse 5 of Psalm 82 in Hebrew. You, we, are Elohim. Well, that's the invisible realm, but we're now in the visible. Yes, for a few years, a little while, then we'll be back in the invisible realm, the unseen realm. And that should be encouraging. So you are all sons and daughters of the Most High. And Jesus says that and he applies it to us. And I think that's an encouragement. And so John chapter 10 has that lovely piece and he, how does he end it? Believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped because his time had not yet come. And verse 42, in that place, many believed in Jesus. He was so clever at answering their questions. And I think that to select Psalm 82, verse 6, was an extraordinarily clever answer. You claim to be God. You're all gods. You're all, you, claim, you claim to be Elohim. You're all <laughs> Elohim. I think that's fascinating. So I rest my case there. You are all sons of the Most High, the words of Jesus. He said, we are simple flesh, but he also sees us as sons of the Most High. And I'm trying to take that on board myself. Amen. Sons of the Most High. A word on that. I had a look at the computer, which is such fun when you can do a word search. 
And I found the phrase sons of God occurs in the NIV and the King James in many places. It's actually six times in the NIV and 11 times in the King James. So if you want to work on that phrase, sons of God, you'll enjoy the King James Version. It's just, and I haven't time to go through them all. But there's a little cliche that sums this up. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become sons of God. So in Christ, that's what we are. Hallelujah.